Jeff for Chicago Jazz Magazine, and welcome to the feature interview for September 2019 for Chicago Jazz Magazine. I am thrilled to finally sit down with Charles Rick Heath IV. We have been talking about doing this for many years, and the time is right. He has a lot of stuff going on. He is starting a show at the Drury Lane, The Color Purple, which he did in the past. We're going to talk about that. He's got Charles Heath Presents, which is an incredible uh, showcasing mechanism that he puts on. Yeah. He's got a jam session that he runs, the Early Risers Jam Session at Andy's Jazz Club, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. every Sunday night. He's doing the Ken Cheney Scholarship Foundation. We're going to talk about that and all of the good things he does with youth education. Well, I think the interview's over. I just covered it all, right? You did it all, Mike. Man, oh, man. I mean, so he's a drummer, and we're going to talk about everybody he plays with, including Ramsey Lewis, and an entrepreneur. So it's a pleasure to sit down with somebody who I can relate to because I have a lot of different things going on, and so do you. But before we get into everything, why don't we talk about this show that's kicking off at the Drury Lane? Yeah. Right? What is it? September 13th, I want to say? That's right. Through the through November. And this is actually a revisit of a show that you did and you, you toured with uh, a few years ago. So yeah. let's talk a little bit. The Color Purple, the musical. Yeah, definitely. Uh, started... Uh my touring date started back in 2007. I uh, started as a sub, actually, uh, for a good friend of mine named Y.L. Douglas. But before that, I was dating a young lady. Uh, loved my wife, but it wasn't her. <laughs> that was a while ago. That was, <laughs> that was a long, 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 <laughs> long time ago, Mike. But uh, anyway, happy anniversary to my wife. First year. What a way, what a way to say happy birthday. Happy anniversary. Then on the Chicago Jazz feature interview video, it's here forever now. It's the best. It's, that's it. You know, August 18th. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. So um, back in 2007, I was full-time teacher in Chicago public schools, mm -hmm. teaching all day, gigging all night. Like K through 12 or whatever? I mean, you were, you right. were like there. You I were the teacher. Yeah. Wow. Nine to five. Yeah. Yeah. So um, get a phone call. And the young lady that I was seeing said, you should go down and audition for The Color Purple. I heard they're doing auditions. So I found out where. Just finished doing a great recording with Larry Gray and his trio. Uh, so I brought that down as advertisement mm -hmm. for myself. So I went in, uh, went to the stage door, and I said, I'm here for the interview for the drum chair for The Color Purple. And they said, I... Uh, is your name on the list? I said, no, but it should be. <laughs> so she says, let me call downstairs and find out what's happening. Yeah. So she called downstairs. She said, well, according to them, your name shouldn't be on this list. <laughs> so I'll see you later. I said, I know. But please give them this CD. I would love to just put my name in the hat if anything should come up yeah. or if you need the drummer. So at any rate, the contractor appreciated my persistence and emailed me before I got home and said, hey, I appreciate you, you know, coming down to see if you could do the gig. So I said, well, no problem. Can I do the gig? So he said, well, there's no way you can learn 31 songs in less than 24 hours. I said, send me the music. I'll learn the music. Did he send it? No. No, of course <laughs> of not. Of course not. Of course not. So it, at any rate, long story short, a good friend of mine, Y.L. Douglas, he got the drum chair for the Color Purple uh, touring company started here in Chicago. And that was like the that was like one of the original uh, versions of it, right? I mean, That's Oprah right. and Quincy and everybody they were involved in in that hand in hand pretty yeah. much because they were kicking it off, right? That's right. That was the first touring company. Yeah. Uh, so, YL calls me, say, "Hey, man, I need a drum sub for Color Purple. I can't do all these dates, you know, matinees." So I said, "Sure." So, get to uh, first rehearsal. Get on the elevator with a gentleman who happens to be the person that told me no initially. <laughs> so, which Hi is there. a contractor, right? So I said, hey, how's it going? What are you doing? So I said, I'm, I'm here for the drum chair. You know, what's your name? I said, Charles Heath. He said, man, didn't I tell you no? <laughs> I said, well, I'm YL's sub. I'm supposed to be here now. He said, well, you made your way anyway, didn't you? I said, absolutely. <laughs> so I was subbing for YL. Since the tour started here, YL was fine with the dates here for about nine months. It's, that was it's a long at, run, right? Yeah. In Chicago, yeah. Sat at the Cadillac Theater for about nine months. So uh, I did that. Then it was going on the road, uh, traveling from coast to coast. But YL couldn't travel, so they had someone else in place, of course, because they didn't hear me play. 
But once they heard me play, they said, oh, he's cool. So long story short, again, they had another drummer come in. They loved his playing, but they were kind of used to what I was doing. So they said, well, would you be interested in traveling with us for you know, the duration of yeah. this tour, which was two years? Wow. So I said, absolutely. So I toured from coast to coast for about two years and met a lot of great people. Oh, Even yeah. met Quincy Jones and got a great story about that. Uh, go to the opening night uh, party in L.A. after the show. So I'm walking around, you know, being Charles Heath, <laughs> got my suit on, you know, bringing a Chicago vibe yeah, to L.A. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he comes up to me. He said, man, where are you from? I said, Chicago. Well, first he said, man, I like your vibe. I was like, really? Did he even know you were the drummer? He didn't know I was a drummer. He just liked your vibe at that point. Okay. All he right. said, man, I like your vibe. He said, what are you doing the show? I said, I'm a drummer. He's like, oh, man, that's a heavy chair. That's great. So you sound great. So I was like, man, this is Quincy Jones telling me right. I sound great. So at any rate, he said, well, where are you from? I said, I'm from Chicago. He said, that's why. <laughs> that's why. So after that, I went around the whole party saying Quincy Jones likes my vibe. <laughs> And that's my famous Quincy Jones. Oh man, story. that's great. Yeah. That's great. Well, I mean, and and he was around the show a little bit too, wasn't he? I mean, just especially when it was in L.A. I'm sure because he had a, a hand in the musical. I mean, in the whole layout of the whole thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. He actually uh, did the music for the the movie. That's what I thought. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. But so the, you, you were on tour for two years. Two years. I mean, that's a that's a long commitment. I mean, and yes. and doing the same show did you ever get like burned out on it like oh man well the cool thing about the playing this show it covered every genre of music so mm. it was never boring and we only traveled with um five touring musicians but we picked up the rest of the musicians locally so it was incredible to play in la with some of the same musicians that played on the actual movie score oh, like wow. the string section uh the bassist was Reggie Hamilton, who played with everybody from Madonna to um, Whitney Houston and still yeah. touring, playing with a lot of people. But the composers of the uh, actual play was Brenda Russell, uh, Stephen Bray, who also writes for Madonna, uh, and Allie Willis, who uh, wrote uh, September for Earth, Wind & Fire. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, she writes for everybody. Yeah. All the TV theme shows, she's the one to go to. So you got you got to know them, probably. Oh, right? yeah. They they would come sit in at rehearsals in various cities, and it would just be great to just collaborate with them, and they would give me pointers on what I could do. Yeah. So it was wow. it was just incredible. You know, I think that that's one of those things, because there's a lot of work in Chicago for theater. You know, a lot of theater work in Chicago, especially, sure. you know, and, and it might have been more then, but I think there, I think there's still a good amount happening in Chicago now. Sure. But I think people don't realize the players that are in those musicals are like some of the top guys in the city <laughs> because it's like a steady gig, first of all. That's it right. pays great, blah, yeah. blah, blah. But then you being able to travel and tour, mm -hmm. and now you can easily call up anybody that you met over those two years and say, hey, it's Charles. Hey, how's it going, Charles? You know, you can right. talk to anybody, right? And sure. I think... Networking-wise, that had to be incredible for you. It was tremendous yeah. for me because not only was I the drummer, but I was also the librarian. Uh, so what I would do is uh, I would forward all the music to the contractors in various cities. So the contractors are like the ones that hire all the musicians. Sure, yeah. So they know everybody. They know all the uh, clubs, the musicians, you know. So to have that contact was also amazing. So, so let me get this straight. Wait a minute. So. Yeah. You couldn't get the gig because the contractor in Chicago <laughs> didn't want to hire you. But now you know every contractor in the in the US because they gotta get the book from you ahead of time and That's then right. they have to oh see? It's diabolical, man. Hey man, it was meant to be. I'm living right. <laughs> That's <laughs> That's awesome. So you did that for two years. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to go deep down the wormhole, but I'm always curious, especially with the drum chair. I mean, what are some of the biggest uh, challenges? coming in and playing like, well, your first rehearsal, your first gig or whatever it is. I mean, you're reading the charts down, especially in your case, you're subbing. So now you're reading the charts down, but right. you had to learn all this stuff. What are some of the things? Well, and actually maybe this pertains to like some of the gigs, right? Ramsey gigs and things sure. like that. You got to learn the tunes 
Mm -hmm. What are some of your pointers? Because I know we have a lot of musicians watching this in addition to, you know, the jazz fans and music fans. What are some of your pointers or what are some of the key things that you do when you first say, okay, I got to learn all these tunes? Is there a system that you go down? I mean, do you just start playing them? What, what, do, you, what do you think about when you first say, okay, I got to learn this stuff. Here we go. Right. Uh, what I did was I made it internal. So it's one thing to say, okay, I can read these charts, but if your paper falls off the stand <laughs> or if you can't turn the paper over, right. you know, the music over, then, you know, because you got to play a percussion part with your left hand and you're doing something else with your right hand. So you really have to internalize the music. That's, that's my biggest, um, you know, uh, suggestion mm -hmm. in learning music and trying to uh, accomplish or do a great job, you know, on a gig. Uh, I know the first, and the sub chair is the hardest chair to be in uh, because, number one, as a sub, you don't have any run-throughs with the cast right, or you the just musicians. Start, it's you, right? They throw you in the fire and say, play. <laughs> you know, so no rehearsal, no run through. All you have is yourself uh, playing over it, and you also edit the show, which means that you come down to the pit and you watch the original drummer play, you know, the mm -hmm. guy that you're subbing for play and how he goes about doing the show. So I took notes and I tried to play everything like him. So my first show, I was shaking like a leaf because the thing when you play theater, when you hit a snare drum, that could be a smack on stage, oh. you know? So when the snare drum goes pop, somebody's probably popping somebody in the eye on stage so I can give it that effect oh, of yeah. a pop, you know? But if you're a, a second off or beat off of that pop and it's a delayed reaction, so if somebody goes pop, <laughs> <laughs> it really it's loses the, it's very you know and you will get a note you know <laughs> so that's what I mean by internalizing the music and just being relaxed yeah. you know so you don't have to think about it you can just have fun how long did it take you before you were just on that show specifically how long did it take you before you were just like on autopilot where you were like okay I know exactly what's happening here everything's timed out good I mean it had to be a bunch of run throughs right a bunch of shows I should say yeah, I would have to say uh, maybe the second week because I was doing all the matinee shows, so I did about three shows a week. Okay. So I would say about the second week I was good. Yeah. Because all the guys in the pit were my friends. Right. And they made that a lot, a lot more. That's uh, probably true too, because you knew a lot of those guys probably yeah. from around town or whatever. If you would have walked in ice cold, nobody knows you. They're looking at you like, well, who is this dude? Man? Exactly. That would have been a whole other ball game problem. Oh yeah, man. So. <laughs> I only, I only bit off half of my finger. <laughs> yeah. So what? So also with that, with the show thing, and I'm, I'm curious because getting into the jazz, uh, you know, realm, and we'll go back down the wormhole a little bit as far as where you got started and all that. But before we close out on the kind of the, the, the playing of the musical aspect, were you playing with a click track? I mean, is everything timed out? How do you know the tempos? You're just working off the conductor. How does that work? Uh, mainly conductor because, again, when you're playing live, anything could happen on stage. Uh, the actors could have a, a wardrobe malfunction, which means that uh, we have to have a safety, which means that you're continuing to loop hmm. a certain section in the music. So you just have to watch, yeah, basically. And then a lot of times the drummer would save the show uh, by either you know filling in or playing something just to ad lib for a while. Oh really? You know. Like a, a drum solo in the middle of the color purple? A little something like that. <laughs> My claim to fame. <laughs> but they never knew. Right. That's the only thing Everybody about playing theater. Real, yeah. Right? A lot of people would come to the front and said, Oh, I thought that was a recording. So they would be surprised to look down and see oh. live musicians playing the actual music. They had no idea. They had no idea. Wow. That we were down there. Yeah. Providing the yeah. pops. The pops and all, and all that. <laughs> yeah, everything. That's fascinating. But, that, I mean, that, yeah. that kind of goes along with, you know, I guess people's uh, attention span and people what people are focused on and what they're not even thinking about. Because uh, sure. 25, 30 years ago, everybody would have just assumed there's a live orchestra down there. That's right. Not a recording, but now it's flipped. It is. You it know, is. Now it's completely flipped. It's a different day, man. So when you were learning drums and coming up, obviously your sight reading is happening and, mm -hmm. and to be able to do these shows. But I mean, when you first started 
uh, learning drums and picking up drums. I mean, I read a little bit of your bio. Apparently, you were tapping your feet and everything in church during the drums, when the drums were going and all that. So obviously, you started and it was internalized pretty early. When did you start getting kind of formally into the drums? And was the were you always connected with, you know, sight reading and all that stuff when you were learning? Or was it just natural stuff and then you moved into kind of formal study? I would really just have to give all praise to God because it's a, it's a God-given talent, really. Uh, my mom was carrying me, and she would sit by the drums in church before I was born. When the drums started kicking, I started kicking. <laughs> and when they stopped, I stopped. So she said, oh, this guy's going to be a musician. <laughs> so once I was born, before I can talk or walk, anything I could put my hands on, I was playing. Oh. So from there, they bought me a toy drum, drum set. They saw I was serious. Then I started playing. How old were you when you got a toy drum set? Man, I had to be about two or oh, three. Gee. You know? See, my parents made me try every other instrument <laughs> other than drums, and all I told them I wanted to play drums, and it was every other instrument they were trying me. And finally, they were like, just give them a drum set. It was the noise so, factor, man. I guess, well, of course it was. <laughs> you Crazy. know, it's drums, though. No, you're going to play piano. Right, that's really good for you. <laughs> yeah, it's much it's, better for everybody. It's good for your fingers and your arms. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, or that whole thing, like, if you learn piano, you'll be a better drummer. Oh, really? You see? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't believe them. <laughs> Thank so God. you didn't have to wait. You just went right in then. That, that right was in. That's straight good. In. Yeah. That's good. So from there, uh, just continue to play in church, play for the children's choir. Then Just picking things up. Is picking that, things yeah. up and just watching musicians. And my family, uh, my mom's side, they're all musicians. So I have an uncle that played drums with Jimmy Smith, Jack McDuff, oh, wow. and all those guys when they were coming to town. Um, he was the house drummer at the uh, other place, which is a club that used to be located down the street from Von Freeman's Apartment Lounge. Okay, 79th. 75th. 75th. Yeah, 75th yeah. and King Drive. It was a nice uh, club, but I was too young to right. get in. But I would see him in the window, you know, playing. So I said, man, I'm going to get there. Yeah. So finally yeah. I did. Wow. Well, and, and I find from interviewing all of the different musicians that when there's like a professional musician on the same instrument, in the family, there's just like a little bit more motivation or there's something that, that you've watched forever yeah. and it just, you pick it up faster, it seems like, than Absolutely. somebody just trying to learn like cold. For sure. You know? So when did you start learning like formally? Did you start taking lessons at some point? I mean. You know, that's very interesting. Uh, went to South Shore High School and that was the first time I really uh, got into reading music. So I played a little timpani, very little timpani, um, and mainly snare drum. But we didn't really have a strong music program at that time, but it was okay. So the way I received my formal training was, uh, long story short again, because I have a lot of stories, <laughs> man. Know. But this one is incredible. Uh, I was just practicing snare drum mm -hmm. in the band room one day, and I was a senior, and I was on my way to... Um, Southern Illinois in Carbondale, they offered me like a $500 scholarship. To go to SIU for, yeah. for music? For music. For music, yeah. So I said, all right, you know, whatever. Because I really didn't have mallets under my belt. And right. you know, when you do the um, interview for the scholarship, they make you play all that stuff. Yep. So at any rate, I'm practicing, and this guy walks in to the band room. He said, man, you sound great. How would you like a full scholarship? I said, uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Did you even ask where? You just said, sure. <laughs> no? Full scholarship? Absolutely. But anyway, it was Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. So, um, Who was the guy that walked into the room? Professor Charles Brown. Okay. And we're still good friends to this day. I learned so much from him, uh, how to be on time, how to be punctual, how to be prepared for gigs what have you, so. What was he doing in the band room? Was he up there just on a recruiting? Oh, really, he was up there on a recruiting He was recruiting, yeah. he was recruiting. Uh, his main locations to recruit was uh, Chicago, because he knows a lot of good musicians come out of Chicago, mm -hmm. Atlanta, uh, DC, and um, New York. Okay. Those were the four main yeah. stops. So when he came to Chicago, he heard me playing, and he picked up a couple of the horn players as well. And, but he offered me a full scholarship because he said, you play drum set? I said, yes. You play jazz? 
Absolutely. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that did it because yeah. I didn't have a drum set player uh, ah. at the school. So he said, would you like a full scholarship? Yes, <laughs> I'll take it, <laughs> without a doubt. So I uh, went to school, and but the interesting thing was he didn't uh, allow me to study drum set. He said, I want to take you out of your comfort zone, number one. Number two, you could find a 10-year-old kid that can come in here and wear these drums out, mm -hmm. you know, no degree, no formal training, just talent, raw talent. But how many people do you know can come in and play marimba, timpani, xylophone, vibes, things like that? So I said, I fought them all the way. He <laughs> said, man, trust me, this will enhance your drumming, the way you play melodically on the drums. You start hearing pitches and tones and mm -hmm. all these other great things being a percussionist. So I said, all right. So finally, the more I did it, the more I started loving it. So then he said, man, you can even get gigs. You don't need anybody. You can play recitals and do gigs later on after you graduate. So sure enough, that's what happened. I started getting calls. People found out I went to school for not just drum set, but percussion. Got called to do a couple recordings on Marimba. Awesome. Uh, did a couple recitals on Marimba at various churches. So it, it actually paid off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and I mean, you know, we're both drummers, and mm -hmm. we both know how to play mallet instruments and all that. Although I haven't played mallets in quite a while because I don't have to. But but you know, I used to <laughs> right. love it. But you know. Yeah. But but I'm with you, and also I think that it's interesting because when you're playing with people, your ears are wide open now. Where you you know, I think mm -hmm. that playing those mallet instruments, and you tell me if I'm wrong, you hear changes differently than when you were just a drummer. Absolutely. And and a lot of times it really bugs the other musicians when the drummer knows more of the changes than they do. And you're like, hey, man, what are you doing? You know, but right. it helps so much in the overall musicality of a drum set. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Because to me, well, as I've heard many other people say, the drummer is really the conductor of the band, even though there is a band leader. You know, you want a great band, get a good drummer. You know, if if the drum, if the band isn't happening, Check, check the drummer out first. Right. You know, so um, because the drummer is the one who sets up the different sections of the music and can control dynamics, um, you know, which is very important in playing music, which is something that I learned a lot from uh, my mentor and good friend, uh, Ramsey Lewis. You know, he really schooled me on dynamics because he says you want to bring the audience into what you're doing. You don't want to push them away. And a lot of times, a lot of people don't realize that they're pushing them away, even though they, they're killing musicians. But if you start all the way up here, you have nowhere to go. You know, but if you stay here and then bring it up, then take a turn and yeah. then, you know, gradually and then drop them back down again, you know, they're, they're on a journey with you. Yeah. You know, versus being all like this in your face the whole time. Well, and, that, and that's something that, I mean, you bring up a great point because that's something that, I've always heard too is that you know if the band's not happening, it's probably let's start in the rhythm section <laughs> and let's start with the guy with the drumsticks That's first. Right. You know. That's right. But the other point is that I think is really important. And I don't know. You know. I mean, I think for musicians listening to this, it could pertain on any instrument. Mm -hmm. If you start wailing, where else are you going to go? You're going to excite the crowd by quieting all the way down. Right. No, you <laughs> you can't. That's right. It's got to go somewhere. And it's interesting that Ramsey brought that up. So. I mean, you played with Ramsey, and, and we might as well kind of segue into that a little bit, and we'll come back to the other stuff. But since you brought up Ramsey, mm -hmm. um, was is that something that when you first started working with him, he brought up to you and said, hey, you know what? Because my whole thing, and you tell me, but my whole thing, I always love it when I'm working with somebody, if it's their group, and I'm working with them, and they just tell me what they want. Mm -hmm. Just tell me. Yeah. I don't want to guess. Just, I can do whatever. Tell me. I don't want to, like, leave the bandstand and be like, you know, hear later that you weren't real happy with what was going on. Just tell me right then and there. Just say, right. hey, man, let's cool that down, do that, do that. Then everybody's yeah. on the same page. How do you feel about that? The exact same way. Yeah. Uh, you know, but the, the good thing is uh, really being able to pay attention. You know, uh, it's almost like being in a relationship. You have to be able to read your wife's mind. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be able to read their mind without 
saying anything, you yeah. know. So that's what I kind of, I think that's one of the things that Ramsey liked about me is that I paid attention to when he got softer, when he went into the upper register. I wasn't on the ride, you know, mm -hmm. welling away. You know, I was, okay, he's coming down, so I'm going to bring it down with him. Yeah. You know, so he, he dug that about me right right away. I was sensitive to that fact. And the thing that helped me be sensitive was playing mallets because in orchestral music, you have dynamic markings. Mm -hmm. In jazz music, there are no, no dynamic no, markings. No dynamic you have to create markings. your own, yeah. you know. So, um, and it would be on the spot, you know, because sure. it's, jazz is improvised. Mm -hmm. So you're composing as you go along. So you're writing your own dynamic markings in as you go along. Uh, so with Ramsey, that, that was the case. He's an incredible improviser. And his dynamics was key, yeah. you know, and playing with him. And then I, I would just watch him draw the audience in. They would be on the edge of their seats like, okay, like what is he going to do next? And then he'll take a left turn and we'll go with him, yeah. you know, no matter where it was, you know. So... That's that that would be uh, you know how I really became sensitive to the music even more as a drummer and working with him because he was a stickler on playing dynamics. Well, and you're you're also somebody that is very aware of what's going on. I think I, I, maybe mm -hmm. maybe a lot of people aren't. You know what I mean? Like I mean I'm sure. always watching. I'm always paying attention whether I'm playing or whether I'm just kind of like around you know I'm just I'm, I'm always aware of my surroundings I'm aware of what's going on I'm aware of kind of of what's happening especially playing wise so sure. you're somebody that's probably really super aware so you're picking stuff up that he probably didn't have to say to you because you're already on top of it you're mm -hmm. and you're noticing all this right here I mean how many other drummers are like noticing all of these things that are going on with the audience and everything right, I mean that's right. that's something that I think puts you to that other level too right yeah, paying paying attention really helps, and not just on the stage, but also off the stage. I was watching him how he was a gentleman mm -hmm. uh, when ladies would come into the green room, or anybody would come into the green room. He would stand up and shake their hand when he doesn't have to. It doesn't matter who they are, you right? Know? So uh, or, or who they were, uh, he would just be the ultimate gentleman and stand up, shake their hand. And wouldn't sit down until the conversation was over, you know. And he doesn't have to because he's an he's Ramsey Lewis. He's an icon, <laughs> you know. And then I also watched him um, just handle the business act aspect of uh, being a musician because he said, "Charles, it's called the music business. It's just not called music. You have to be just as good at at your business as you are." At uh, being a musician. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the main things I learned off the stage. Yeah. Playing with Ramsey and then traveling, you have to be down to earth and, you know, just be cool because flight delays, the instrument isn't cool that you have to play, but people are still expecting a great show, mm -hmm. you know? So just learning how to make uh, lemonade out of some lemons, basically. Yeah. So I bet you learned a little bit of that. I bet you learned a little bit of that when you were in college too because it sounds like your mentor in college your professor right was teaching you a lot of the basis stuff and then when you started playing with Ramsey mm -hmm. and probably playing with a lot of other people you were aware of you know because sometimes we've all been around musicians where it's just like they get done playing man they could care less whatever they're out of here see you later That's right. hey how's it going and, they, and they're gone and you know whatever's going on yeah. so when you came back from college did you come right back to Chicago then and then you started sitting in and playing around Chicago while you were teaching full-time? Uh, pretty much. Came back and I went into the classroom right away. Because uh, you, you had a uh, music ed degree, right? Is that well, what you got? Well, I actually or? majored in um, music performance, but I minored in education. Okay. Uh, because, again, Professor Brown, he said, man, anybody can play. You don't need a degree to play. And that's what I tell a lot of uh, the, the young musicians coming up around me. I say, you know, anybody can play. When you go to play at a jazz club, when you play at Andy's or the Green Mill, or you know, let me see your college degree. What what did you major? No, they want to know. Can you play your instrument? You mean they don't ask you that at Andy's? That's weird. I don't... <laughs> you're preaching to the choir. At you this know point, what I'm so saying? So keep going. Yeah, no, you're preaching to the choir, especially but, with the cost of college now. Man. Yeah, yeah. You know. So make that degree count for something. That's, that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. you're right. You're right. Seriously. 
But I mean, it's cool if if that's what you want to do, if you want to play. But it's still a good thing to have, even if you major in performance. Right. But I always tell us, you know, musicians, young musicians, education is the key that unlocks the door. They're always going to need teachers, mm -hmm. you know. So whether it's private school, charter school, public school, and the way schools are now, there's not a lot of music ed uh, programs happening. So you can start your own business creating your own atmosphere and contracting schools, which is what I do, mm -hmm. uh, that don't have music programs and still bring in, you know, bring up the next generation of musicians and give back while making a little bit of money while yeah. you do it. Yeah, well, and, and you get that stable thing. I mean, it's always Absolutely. nice. I mean, even with you, everything you've done, you're still teaching, you're doing clinics, you're doing those kinds of things. And with your ed degree, it probably gets you in to have conversations that somebody without an ed degree would never be able to have Absolutely. with a superintendent or with a principal or whoever, right? So That's I right. mean, so you came back, you're, you're teaching full time, which yeah. was great that you got a full time gig right when you came back. So you're Absolutely. probably like, thank goodness I got this degree. Right. Because <laughs> I was like, what am I going to do now? Right. You know, but so. then you started sitting in at night, you, 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 because you knew what you wanted to do. So you were out. That's right. Hanging and sitting. Yeah. So how many nights a week? Because I always tell people when I got done with college, and I didn't get a degree, but when I get done with, I was down there on performance. So when I get mm. done with college, I sat in every single night. Yeah. Like for two years, like nonstop. Didn't matter how tired I was from working all day or whatever was going sure. on. What was your What was your situation? It was basically the same thing. Yeah. I, I always hung around the older cats. You know, even in high school, I started early, like going where I can go and get in where I can get in. I would sneak into. Bond Freeman's the apartment, the apartment lounge, and sit in there when, when I could. So when I came back, my name was already kind of in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. You know, people knew who you were. Yeah, kind of, sort of. Yeah. You know, and then um, what's interesting is when I was in high school again, uh, there was a program called Urban Gateways. Oh yeah, I remember uh, that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So Ken Cheney, who is a great mentor. Uh, who uh, really showed me the way on, on a lot of things. But he uh, was doing a, a gig at the school, my high school, South Shore, with his trio. So uh, all my friends were saying, let Charles play, let Charles play. So he said, uh, who's Charles Heath? He stopped the concert and said, who's Charles Heath? <laughs> so I had my stick bag. You know, I walked up there. You know, I said, I'm Charles. So he said, you want to play? I was like, yeah. He said, what do you want to play? I said, I want to swing something. He said, oh, really? <laughs> so, I was like, what does this kid know about swinging? So anyway, I got in, got on the drum set, played some jazz, and Frank Russell was in the band. Oh, who yeah. I know he yeah, you play with, yeah. Yeah, a great mentor, friend of mine. Uh, so at any rate, I sat in with the band. So after I finished, Ken said, do you have a car? I said, yeah. So You're in high school, you got a business card. Had a so business you already, card. You already but had the thing together. was, the card was for the ladies. <laughs> I had Slick Rick, <laughs> my middle name, with a little diamond up on the side. And I was, you know, talking to the ladies, like, yeah, take my card, give me a call sometime. <laughs> but at any rate, he was impressed that I had a card. I'm impressed that you had a card for the ladies. That's what I'm impressed <laughs> with. Why didn't I think about that? Smooth, man. Man, you know. oh, man. <laughs> Because so, if they called, you knew they were interested already. Look at this guy, man. Well, the car did it, so they, they wanted to make sure, you know. You got to come back for a whole other show. We got to talk about that. Whole other show. <laughs> Class is every Saturday <laughs> from 10 to 11. <laughs> no. Uh, so anyway, gave Ken the car. So he said, would you be interested in joining my band? I said, well, I'm on my way to school, full scholarship. Can't join right now. Right. Four years later, came back to Chicago. Got a call to play with a band called Crosswind, Greg Penn Crosswind. So Ken was on piano on this gig. Ken didn't remember me because it's four years yeah. later. And uh, so after the gig, he comes up to me, said, Hey, man, I like the way you play. Do you have a card? Sure do. <laughs> this time it was more professional. Right, it wasn't you know. Slick Rick anymore. That's right. It's Charles Rick, he's the fourth on this card. So I said, Here you go, man. It's like, Man, I know this name from somewhere. So he said, uh, Charles Heath, where the... I said, you let me sit in with your band when I was in high school at South Shore. He was like, right. You're, are you ready to join my band now? I said, absolutely. So Ken is the reason why Chicago knows me. So that's, that's how I kind of got put on the scene so quickly because 
But he was Ken. playing all the time. Yeah. He was, you know. man, I worked so much Yeah, working with Ken, you know, in the early 2000s. It was incredible, you know. Yeah, he was playing everywhere. I mean, Every weekend like, we were somewhere, yeah. you know, during the week, somewhere, steady gigs. It was great. Now, a lot of it was jazz, but he also did some jobbing stuff and some things like that, too, right? So Absolutely. you had to, you had a whole bunch of different genres you were started working with right then and there. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So it, he really groomed me to play with anybody, you know. Yeah. So when I would get various calls from different people, I was ready. Yeah, it was no big deal. No big deal. Because playing with him, I mean, he was a master piano player, obviously. Super nice guy. That's right. And uh, we should talk a little bit, since we're talking about Ken Cheney, the scholarship. Yeah. Uh, is it the scholarship foundation? Or you explain it a little bit, because it's... Yeah, it's it's a scholarship foundation that I started when Ken passed um, some years ago. I started the scholarship because I wanted to do something uh, to remember Ken and keep his legacy going, because... He's the reason why so many musicians in Chicago are who they are. Um, he groomed young musicians and trained them to be professionals. Uh, Dee Alexander got her start with uh, Ken Cheney, Corey Wilkes, mm -hmm. uh, Frank Russell, um, Maurice Brown. All these great musicians are now off doing incredible things, and it's because they went through the school of Ken Cheney. Uh, so when he passed away, I wanted to do something uh, to keep that legacy happening, keep it going, because, you know, the older cats were starting to pass away, and now it's my turn to do what they did for me and so many other different people. So I, I decided to uh, do a scholarship in his honor, uh, and the scholarship is, is designed to help young musicians with their college tuition as well as help them obtain private lessons, you know, or they can go to a jazz camp during mm. summertime. Yeah. So every year, um, some of the musicians that you may be uh, familiar with now uh, who came through the Ken Cheney Scholarship, such as uh, Isaiah Collier, Jeremiah Collier, sure. Alexis Lombre, mm -hmm. a great pianist who I happen to be working with for the Chicago Jazz Fest. Um, uh, so, so many other great musicians, Micah Collier, great upcoming bass player. Mm -hmm. All these great musicians came through the Ken Cheney Scholarship. So we award musicians money, $1,000 each. Uh, it's not much, but it is something. Oh, it's a, well, it's a lot for so I mean, you know, right. that's a lot to kickstart things. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's just what we're trying to do. We try to give them the introduction to what it's like to uh, be a professional musician, the music business. And uh, the scholarship, we host a annual uh, concert every okay. year where we raise funds for this. And it's going to take place sometime in November. We're working out the kinks now, but uh, this is our fifth year wow. doing it. Um, and we've had some uh, great musicians come through the program. Every first, no, I'm sorry, every second Saturday, we partnered with uh, Whitney Young Library located on 79th and King Drive on the south side, uh, where we give free concerts featuring uh, the uh, recipients yeah. for, for their year. So the 2019 recipients play every second Saturday, uh, providing free music to uh, the general wow. public, which is amazing because not only do we service uh, everyday working people, but we also get homeless people that come in. Oh, really? And they listen to the music, you know, and it touches them so much to see uh, the next generation playing music that they give us, when we ask for donation, they, they give us 50 cent, 15 That's cent. That's awesome. Yeah. Just to show that, you know, we appreciate you bringing this to the community yeah. and, you know, helping these young musicians out. Yeah. Which is the same thing Ken Cheney did, you know. Well, you know, and the other thing is, too, with the with the musicians, first off, they get to play regularly together Absolutely. and all that stuff. But second of all, they also are probably able to get a little mentorship from you on a regular basis or probably a lot of other musicians that they can just, hey, you know, and just call up Charles and say, hey, Charles, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Because they're a scholarship winner, and it's like, hey, you know what? And Because I think that mentorship thing is, is something that, some of these other foundations and things that just give people money to go to college is great. It's unbelievable. It's sure. incredible. But being able to have that mentorship, especially in the arts, 
Yes. Because you know all the trials and tribulations that you go through and you just want to quit half the time and everything else. It's good to be able to talk to somebody that's achieved everything that you want to achieve yeah. on a regular basis. So that's probably what this helps those kids as well. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Because I just stand back and I watch. And at the end of the set, I give them uh, some, you know, okay, you should have did this, you should have done that, you know. But first, I always say, good job, you know. Right. I give them that support. But uh, they learn how to talk to the audience. They, they learn how to present themselves. They know they learn how to dress. Um, because it's not easy um, bringing the audience in, you know, because they're looking, it's like, okay, entertain me. Yep. You know, so that's our job. We're supposed to make them forget about the hard day of work, what's going on at home, you know, all the stresses of life. A lot of people come to hear music to get away from it all. Mm -hmm. So it's up to the band leader or whoever's on the mic to actually connect with the audience so they can say, oh, man, I'm feeling them. I'm having a good time. You know, they crack a couple of jokes here and there or uh, introduce a tune, uh, say, okay, this is what this tune is about. This is the composer. This is why he wrote this tune. And here you go. Yep. We hope you enjoy it. Well, and that's what they used to do back in the 40s and 50s and 60s when people would talk on a microphone and you're at a jazz club or something, they would actually tell you exactly what this tune was. Because actually yeah. a lot of those tunes were just being written half the time, so they're telling you about it. And that brings the audience in. That's and, right. And a lot of the younger kids... A lot of the older musicians <laughs> still don't do that. <laughs> You're talking too loud, Mike. You're talking too loud, man. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> but then you also, in addition to that, you also have uh, the Andy's Early Riser Jazz Jam Session, where yeah. I know a lot of these kids can come and hang out and sit. And you've been doing that on Sundays from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, 8.30. 5 oh, 8.30. Yeah, 5 to okay. 8.30. 5 to 8.30. Yeah, which is incredible. Yeah. So, But that's like all ages at Andy's at that time, I think. So Absolutely. people can come with their kids. They can sit in. They can and, you know, experience that, play with you and play yeah. with the house band and everything. That must be something that you're you're just kind of like, it's it all works together, I think, right? It, it really does. It all connects together. Um, I had a hard time when I first started because so many of the young musicians were so used to playing with each other in their basements. And to get them out to a jam session, it's not like when we were coming up right. where we were eager because we didn't have YouTube. We didn't have all the social media distractions. So now they have all this information and they can just watch concerts and you know their favorite musicians on the computer or on their phone. Why do I need to go out? So what I did was if you have food, kids will come. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is I would contact various schools that I knew had um, uh, jazz programs with up and coming musicians. I would say, okay, you guys put a band together, come dress nicely, and I'm gonna expose you with one or two songs on my jam session day. And slowly but surely, they would start coming in because I said, not only that, I'll treat you to an order of wings <laughs> and fries. Yeah. You know, so they would come in like, oh man, we can eat and we get to play them. And you know, at a renowned jazz club, we're there. Yeah. So. I slowly started weaning them off the wings, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so they they would come start coming on their own, even if they weren't playing to check out other musicians yeah. or just to. Well, you also got to break the ice because, That's like right. you said, they're used to sitting at home watching YouTube videos, watching TV, yeah. playing with people, and to go to Andy's outside of just like, oh man, I got to go, like just breaking that threshold to walk in there. I mean, that's got to be intimidating anyways. You're walking Absolutely. into Andy's Jazz Club. As a kid. As a kid, right. Yeah, as a kid. Yeah. Know? I mean, I was intimidated when I was like, you know, 19 and I'm walking into Andy's <laughs> Jazz Club to sit in, let right. alone as a kid, you that's know. Right. So that's So you broke that ice and yeah. now they're comfortable and they're coming in. Absolutely. Yeah, so we, we get all players, you know, we get players from all over the world coming in now. So um, it's all about exposure, letting them know that it's okay. Yeah. So, and it's a great place for them to, to do oh, it. Oh, yeah. Andy's yeah. is great. But, you know, we should talk a little bit because I think, and you brought up a great point about YouTube. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. I mean, I think when we were both coming up, I, there was, I, I could not just flip on something and watch John Coltrane or Miles Davis from 1960 on my computer. It just was not happening. We had tapes. Yeah, right. VH, VHS tapes. You dig? Yeah. Well, I dig. <laughs> I dig. Rewind. <laughs> 
fast forward. Exactly. Yeah. You just flip it over. What did he just do? Right, right, right. Now there's now there's the technology where they I wish I had this in college. The transcription technology, oh. man. You pop the thing in and it doesn't change doesn't change the pitch, it just slows everything down. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. I would have stuck around and got my degree if that was the case. <laughs> I hear you, man. Man, but but you know, I think it's so important though because whether you hear it on YouTube or com you know on a computer or something like that, there is nothing like hearing jazz specifically, jazz live, because of the sound, because of the way you're hitting the drums, because of the way they're playing the sax. You cannot pick that up watching it. You've got to experience it live, I think. Absolutely. And that's probably, like, I mean, you know, we were just talking about Ken Chaney. You used to go see Vaughn, mm -hmm. uh, Robert Irving III, I think, was somebody that you, obviously you still play with him now, but yeah. probably somebody you heard. But, I mean, those guys, when you would go see them play live, mm -hmm. it's a whole other ball game. Right? Totally, I mean, totally. so that's so important for the kids to experience it live. But what was it like for you? Like, those are such, just some of your uh, people that you used to check out, I think, but to probably yeah. a lot more. But hearing them live and being in a club and hearing the reaction of the club, that's, that, that's inspirational to me. Yeah, well, it's still inspirational. I still go check out musicians live, even though I have access to the same thing the kids have access to, YouTube and everything like that. Because what I tell people in general and this is just for your everyday uh, listener of music, is that the vibrations that you feel when they play the instrument, you can't get that through the um, TV or um, social media. Yeah. You, you just, even if they're streaming live, that vibration, or somebody in the crowd, you look over and somebody's crying, you know, because it's a ballad. It's gonna affect you a different way. So going out to see live music is such an experience within itself, you know, besides the incredible music that's being played, the incredible musicians that's, that's on stage, yeah. it's just a vibration and a passion that goes on with it because the camera is not going to get everybody at the same time. But when you're sitting there, you can see everything that's happening, you know. And feel it. You can feel it. Yeah, so you can see, man, that drummer broke his drumstick and he's playing with one hand while he's picking up another one. You might miss that on YouTube. Mm -hmm. You usually do. <laughs> <laughs> you usually do. You know, so it's, it's just things like that. And uh, me being a, able to experience uh, those great musicians during the time I was coming up was great. Yeah. So a couple more things. So, you know, fast forward, you're playing, you're doing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you and I met a, a bunch of years ago when you were presenting live music on the South Side too, yeah. right? What yeah. is it, uh, uh, jazzing on the South Side? That's right. You still doing that? Well, not anymore. Okay. Uh, it became a bit much because I can imagine <laughs> trying to play and promote and you know do the school thing. So and to advertise to get people to come out because a lot of times people say, "Oh, I want this. We want this." You know, and then you walk into the door and the place is half full. You're saying, okay, where's this money coming from? <laughs> I know all about it. Yeah, so <laughs> you learn how to pray <laughs> real good, you know, so because it has to come from somewhere. But at any rate, um, I still produce concerts. Jazz mm -hmm. on the South Side was great. And the reason why I started it is because after coming back from Color Purple, um, I was gone for two years, so I had to rebrand myself. I had to come up with something different. Yeah. So uh, because all the gigs were gone, you know, because I gave all my gigs away. You gave them all away. I gave them all away. <laughs> I was gone for two years, yeah. so you can't just come back and say, I'm back. Give me my gig back. You know, that's not cool. <laughs> so at any rate, I had to go start sitting in again and doing different things. Yeah. So I said, you know. Let me start this jazzing on the South Side thing because a lot of the clubs were closing and I just wasn't happy with the music scene happening, just not in Chicago, but around the country. Mm -hmm. And touring a lot of the jazz clubs, they just weren't anymore. So um, instead of talking about it, I started walking about it and um, partnered with the Regal Theater mm. um, back in 2010, started there. Then they, uh, shut down and then I went to the ETA theater, uh, stayed there for a few years. Then they uh, shut down temporarily for renovation. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I went to a place called the Caribbean Cove uh, on the south side. That was a nice place. Uh, then they shut down. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, uh, for various reasons. Yeah. Uh, then I said, I need a break. Mm -hmm. So that's when I actually uh, came up with the great idea of partnering with clubs that were already established, and I started uh, doing daytime concerts. So I partnered with uh, Buddy Guys, Legends, as well as uh, Andy's Jazz Club, uh, where I would do uh, daytime concerts for seniors. So um, it was called Live Music in the Afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been great. You know, they come in. They enjoy a good time. Seniors, a lot of times, they don't like to hang out at night anymore. No, they don't. So, no, and they don't want to deal with all the back and forth. And a lot of places don't start. I mean, Andy's is different, but uh, like yeah. Buddy Guys, I mean, the music doesn't really kick off till 9 o'clock at night. It's like, that's right. It's enough of that. Yeah. It's enough of that for me. Half the time on <laughs> Tuesday, I'm like, I got to go to bed. I get up at 4. So, you, know? you know, seriously. So I, I designed this concert series uh, for seniors uh, where... They get a nighttime feel in the daytime. Yeah. So they really dig it. And I also do it for kids as well. I do a uh, school-wide field trip where we contract schools to come out and they enjoy uh, learning about the innovators of jazz, mm. uh, reggae, classical, uh, different styles of music, all while enjoying a delicious lunch wherever the yeah. event is being held. And I also ask them to come dressed in business like attire so they can, because when you dress different, you act different. Yep. So they come out, they look good, and I always encourage the guys to pull out the chairs for the ladies, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so when they get older, it's like, man, I kind of enjoy doing this as a kid. I want to continue to do this, you know. So it's just giving them some culture and giving uh, the seniors a place to go, mm -hmm. giving back to the community. Well, that's what I was going to say. You're giving back to the community. As far as the young kids go, I mean, the seniors, the senior concerts, that's incredible because, yeah. I mean, they, they love that stuff. I mean, we both played for those kinds of things. And, I mean, you know, you would you would think you were on the stage at Carnegie Hall half the time. <laughs> you're going bananas if you play the right. tunes right and everybody loves oh, it. It's yeah. just like they the memories you. come back and it makes everybody feel good in the room. They try to take me home with them. I, I bet. <laughs> and then the kids, you're teaching them, but you're teaching them to, you know, dress up, proper way to do it. They're getting comfortable coming into a club Absolutely. so that it continues on into the future. There should be more of that happening around the city, that's for sure, around the country. Sure. You know, that's sure. for sure. So, I mean, congratulations. As I said at the beginning, you have a hand in everything. I mean, you're an entrepreneur, drummer extraordinaire, everything else. So do you, Mike. Well, you know, I, I try. I'm just a drummer <laughs> with to be three like video you, man. cameras. Trying to yeah, be like you, Mike. Right. Want to be like Mike. <laughs> yeah. The other mic that we all want to be like, <laughs> at least his bank account would be all right. Uh, so let's finish this thing off because we'll wrap it back around. Color Purple, now you're back. You're at the Drury Lane. Yeah. And it's pretty much the similar show, I would imagine. So it's almost like you're you're thrown back into the into the experience that you had for two years traveling yeah. and stuff. It's got to feel probably like a homecoming. It's got to feel good, actually. It feels great yeah. because I know the music yeah. and I feel very comfortable. And I, I always said that I wanted another shot to play the show because if I know now, wait, how do you say it? If I knew back then what I know now, I would have played it totally different. Mm. And that was almost 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, that yeah. I had the gig. Actually, it was. It was, nine years ago? Yeah, yeah. Nine, nine years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I started in 2007. Oh, 2007. I was thinking 2010 or whatever. Yeah, that's, you that's got when off I the left gig the in show. 2009 yeah. or 10. Yeah. So it's been 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So how many days a week is this? Is this like, because uh, I know Drury Lane's incredible. They have, they have it is. what, four or five days a week, I think, sometimes, right? Right. I believe they do matinee on Wednesday. Uh, no show on, on Wednesday night. Um, Thursday night show, Friday night show, matinee Saturday and Sunday, and Saturday and Sunday uh, evening show. Wow. Yeah, so five yeah. nights a week. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So you're booked up until November, but... It's also nice because you're local, mm -hmm. so you can keep all these other things going and happening. And if you're not at the Sunday Jazz Jam session, you will show up there, I'm sure, once you get done with the show or whatever's right. happening and then doing all that stuff and keeping things moving. Definitely. So what's a good website for everybody to go check out all this information? We'll link everything below, and I and you and I will talk off camera about the uh, Ken Cheney Scholarship stuff so we can make sure that we get all the information coming up in November. Maybe we'll have you back to do a little hit on something like that. But sure. what's a good website for everybody to find out about Charles Rick Heath the Fourth? 
Uh, well, primarily KenChaneyScholarship.org. Okay. Is is for that one, and then um, CharlesRickHeath.com. Dot com. Yeah. Okay. We'll link all that stuff up. Man, it was a That's pleasure. It. Pleasure's all mine, oh, man. It was great. And, yeah. And folks, thanks so much. Hopefully, you will check. Charles out performing live somewhere. He's going to be obviously at the Drury Lane, but if you want to check him out on jazz, check out his website. We're going to link everything down below. And thanks again for watching all of this and listening to this. Of course, if you want to watch all of the different feature interviews we have available, you can go to chicagojazzmagazine.com. And we always post podcasts on all the different podcast websites. And we also post regular videos and different videos I do throughout the week. We do two or three, sometimes short little interviews throughout the week, chicagojazz.com. So until next month, I appreciate Charles coming in for our feature interview for September. And until next month, we will see you somewhere, hopefully out on the scene.